hiney, 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 brothers got the hiney, 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 brothers got the hiney, hiney. At work, at home, or on the road, you deserve great coffee. A Heine Brothers coffee subscription plan gives you top quality organic and fair trade coffee delivered right to your door or office automatically. You select the frequency, the quantity, and the variety of coffee, and Heine Brothers will take care of the rest, shipping included. Also makes a great gift, so order online at HeineBrosCoffee.com. That's H-E-I-N-E-B-R-O-S-C-O-F-F-E-E.com forward slash subscription and use the offer code the past for five dollars off any gift subscription congratulations on your acquisition of the past and the curious word of the day recordings today's word is polymath a person of wide ranging knowledge or ability she can do anything from astrophysics to tap dance. What a polymath. Well, hello there. My name is Mick Sullivan, and this is The Past and the Curious, and I thank you so very much for joining us once again. This is a fun episode. These are two people from the past who I bet most people are not familiar with. I had to do a lot of research and a lot of reading to learn more about them. And in some cases, it's hard to learn much about them because they were both pretty long time ago. Joining me for this episode is my good friend, Miss Lynn from the Good Words podcast. I met her through Kids Listen and she creates a really great podcast built around great words and how to use them and learning new vocabulary. It's a really great show and I I really like words. So it was really great to work with her. Uh, She was a big help in this episode. Um, But also the word polymath was really up her alley. That's why I asked her in the first place. So thank you, Miss Lynn. I also need to thank my friend Todd Armstrong for his contributions to the music this week. Um, There's some really great classical guitar playing that you'll hear. That is not me. That is Todd Armstrong. And those are pieces of music that he wrote with his own brain. Amazing. Let's get started. Jamming good in old Cordoba. By some accounts, Ziryab was the equivalent of a Middle Ages rock star. And by that, I don't mean he was like a middle-aged rock star embarrassing his kids by still jumping around the stage in spandex or skinny jeans. I mean, he was a person who changed the world of music and fashion, sort of like a rock star nowadays. But he did it during the actual Middle Ages. And if some of the legendary stories are true, we may all owe him a debt of gratitude 1,300 years later. Of course, the world was very different 1,300 years ago. In the Americas, Woodlands period Native American civilization stretched from Canada down the continent to the Mayans in Central America, as well as the many people of South America. The gigantic continent of Africa was also filled with diverse and high-achieving civilizations, from the ironworking Bura civilization to the gold and camel-rich Ghana Empire. In Europe, this time is now called the Middle Ages, which some people also call the Dark Ages. Many historians argue that this is really not fair because dark implies that there was not a lot being accomplished. There were a few significant cultural leaps that occurred during this period, and occasionally knights on horseback, which is always cool. Yet most people could not read or write, and by comparison with other places and times, Europe wasn't exactly bubbling over with major scientific advancements or technology, or even attire. Heck, normal people wore pretty much the same clothes day in and day out. Most only bathed a few times a year, and when they ate, they piled their unappetizing food all on a plate at once. These folks did have one good idea, though. While they served all of their food at once, many medieval eaters ate off of a plate called a trencher, 
which wasn't a plate at all, but instead a hearty flat piece of bread, which they could eat at the end after it had soaked up all the flavors of their relatively flavorless food. Edible plates. If you got into a time machine and wanted to go to the most advanced place on Earth 1,300 years ago, beyond the genius of edible plates, of course, you might find yourself in Baghdad, Iraq, Baghdad was filled with brilliant scientific minds, vast libraries, incredible and perfectly aligned architecture, and though we might take it for granted today, more paper than anywhere else besides Asia. Being built on the trading routes between Asia and Europe gave the city a unique ability to be shaped by new things. And it was also filled with advanced thinkers in math, science, philosophy, and more. And it was here that Ziryab was born, sometime around the year 709. The details of his early life depend on the story you hear. One reason he's often called a polymath is because some say he was highly skilled in astronomy and other sciences, in addition to his talents as a musician. Truthfully, the science genius part of his story is doubtful, or at least hard to prove. In fact, the most well-researched historians today never mention his scientific achievements because they might have actually been invented or at least inflated by later admirers, people who wanted to make Ziryab larger than he was in real life. Astronomer or not, he was undoubtedly an incredible musician, and as you'll see, much more than that. He sang with a beautiful voice, which is why he earned the name Ziryab, meaning blackbird. The sobriquet is also likely a reference to his dark skin. He accompanied that beautiful voice with the oud, a round-backed stringed instrument that is related to the guitar. It was while studying with one of the leading musicians in Iraq that he came to the attention of the ruler who asked to hear a song from Ziryab. Ziryab was bound to oblige, so he tuned his oud, cleared his throat, took a breath, and sang a song that left the room stunned with wide eyes and mouths agape. The ruler was perplexed. Why hadn't he heard a song from this incredible musician until now? As if to make up for lost time, the ruler now only wanted to hear music from Ziryab. Obviously, this made Ziryab very happy, and he swelled with pride like a blackbird on a sunny tree branch. But Ziryab's teacher was the official court musician, and he felt that Ziryab was stepping on his toes. Mr. Teacher Man was not happy about this turn of events, because he had very sensitive toes, and perhaps a sensitive ego, too. Before long, the jealous musician not so kindly suggested that Ziryab <clears throat> leave town so as not to further embarrass his teacher. He did not wish to share his time before the ruler with anyone, especially the talented Ziryab. So, off Ziryab went. Some histories say he spent time in Syria, others Morocco, others skip over the decade-long gap entirely. But what we know to be true is that he eventually arrived in Cordoba, Spain. Cordoba was located in Al-Andalus, a region of modern-day Spain where Muslims from Iraq and elsewhere would rule for several hundred years. During the Middle Ages, Muslim Spain was a cultural center that could boast well-lit streets, running fountains, libraries, universities, vast public gardens, incredible architecture, and a population that included many learned philosophers and scientists. Not to pour salt in the wound, but by comparison, a mere 1,300 miles away sat London. This immense and historically glorious city was really just a town of several thousand people at this time. Most of them lived in smoky huts made of mud and stone, farmed a meager existence, had a low life expectancy, and didn't really think about things like, mm, sanitation, let alone fashion. So Ziryab was in the place to be, and he quickly became the man to know in the place to be. As a musician, his repertoire was extensive. He could play 10,000 songs from memory and sing them unlike anyone else. He also added an extra string to his oud. This modified instrument allowed him to play new, exciting pieces of music, 
and some say it helped found the rich Cordoba tradition of guitar music the area is still renowned for today. Quickly finding favor with the local ruler, he began to enjoy a nice life. Still, he had some very definite ideas on improving not just his nice life, but the lives of everyone else. In today's terms, Ziryab became a tastemaker or an influencer. This musician was doing things that made people change the way they acted so they could emulate him. Many of these changes remain today. This is a very rock star way to be. If you want a taste of his ideas, look no further than this. His nice life came with certain things, food for one. And while the fare in Cordoba might have been better than what they were eating up in London, it was still served all at once in a giant mess of flavors and textures. Ziryab was not cool with this. What a wasted experience! Food was obviously an essential part of survival, but what was wrong with enjoying it to the fullest, even savoring it? So, he split it up. He began to eat his dinner in courses. Three courses, in fact. Soup was eaten first, the main course was eaten second, and it was all followed by something sweet. In Ziryab's case, fruit and nuts. Today, it's as familiar as can be. Super salad, entree, and then dessert. But in the 8th century, this was a revelation, and as it gained in popularity, it spread far and wide, eventually winding up on the dinner tables of many homes and restaurants. Today, we consider it to be a very normal part of culture. Another thing we consider normal, which you may or may not appreciate, is the idea of asparagus on the dinner table. Until Ziryab came along, it was considered a weed but he showed people it could be a delicious part of dinner. Don't know about you, but personally, I am grateful for that. According to Zuryab legends, though, he was far from done with simply reforming dinner time. There was fashion and hygiene to tackle as well. As you might imagine, people in the 700s were more odoriferous than you or I typically are today. I don't want to call them stinky, but they were probably pretty stinky. Baths were uncommon. If you did take a bath with any regularity, you probably shared the bath water with everyone else in your house. So if you were last in line for the tub, you were probably better off not even getting in. It is said that during his time in Muslim Spain, Ziryab popularized not just regular baths, but also created an early version of deodorant to help the body odors be less offensive to those around. People were grateful for the olfactory relief. His commitment to end stink didn't end at body stink. He knew bad breath was gross too. So he was one of the earliest proponents of the very same ritual you and I engage in every morning and night, brushing your teeth. Without a doubt, people noticed that Ziryab and his friends smelled better than many of the other folks walking around in the medieval world. Likewise, people were also probably filled with curiosity and a twinge of jealousy as they hungrily watched Ziryab and his friends truly enjoy their food more than anyone else around. They were simple things, but they were big changes. Perhaps this is why people paid attention when Ziryab gave us what might be his most significant gift. Clothes were very plain, and many people wore the same things day in and day out. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to wear the same thing I wore in the winter during the summer. Ziryab is said to have popularized wearing different clothes for each season. The clothes he helped popularize were different materials, wools for winter, linen for summer. He also saw a value in varying the colors, darks in the winter and brights in the spring and summer. Open any clothing catalog and you'll find these sartorial trends endure today. Obviously, one man couldn't do all of this alone and it would take a larger cultural shift to really change the way people ate, bathed and dressed. But when things are popularized by cultural icons or Middle Ages rock stars like Ziryab, 
people have always been more likely to follow the trends and change their behaviors. Long after his death and long after the reign of Islam in Spain, the spirit of Ziryab lived on as the music school he founded in Cordoba continued to train musicians for centuries. Today, he is more of a mystery than a man. Because so many of his biographies were written long after his death, and because his experiences seem so far removed from our own lives, it is hard today to tell what is fact and what is myth. But the Ziryab we do know was a musician with many other skills beyond simply playing the oud very well. Hey, Riley of Union, Missouri. You have 30 seconds to tell us something awesome on your market set go. Many people have think Christopher Columbus discovered America, but that's just not true. People have found proof that it may have been discovered by Vikings. Leif Erikson, a famous Viking landed in America in the year 1000, left after fighting with Native Americans. Thank you, Riley. I love a good Viking story. And if anyone out there would like to participate in You Have 30 Seconds, all you have to do is check the instructions on our website, thepastandthecurious.com. It is so, 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 so easy. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. Okay, here we go. Do you know what kite flying, library, and fire department founding American polymath from the 1700s wrote newspaper articles as a teenager under the fake name Silence Do Good? Ben Franklin is definitely someone people think of when they think of a polymath. Aside from his political intelligence and his work as the French ambassador at a very important time for America, he was an inventor, scientist, writer, and publisher who made incredible observations about ocean currents, electricity, and more, while also inventing bifocals, the lightning rod, and a new kind of stove with which to heat your home safely. Question number two. During the Middle Ages, a future Catholic saint Hildegard von Bingen achieved more than nearly any woman of her time. She was an artist and composer whose music is still performed today, over 800 years later. She was also a writer who published poems, books, and even a play. But she also nurtured a talent for science, particularly concerning plants. Do you know the word for the scientific study of plants? Hildegard was interested in botany. If you said botany, you are correct. That is the study of plants. And in between her job as a nun, writing music and creating art, she traveled around Europe discussing the subject, eventually publishing two different botanical books. Despite struggling with her health as a child, she lived well into her 80s, dying in the year 1179. I remember it like it was yesterday. Question number three. Your third and final question. When most people think of a polymath, they think of Leonardo da Vinci. He was an incredible inventor and an expert in engineering, biology, anatomy, geology, map making, and of course, art. He was a sculptor, but is perhaps best known for paintings. But do you know how many of his paintings actually still exist today? Most people think that there are a plethora of surviving paintings, but in reality, experts state that there are only 15 paintings in the world created by da Vinci. Many have been lost to time or perhaps have been misidentified and attributed to other artists. His most famous though is probably the Mona Lisa, which gets over 9 million visitors a year at its home in Paris. <laughs> Joseph Boulon, also known as the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, had never lost a fencing match. Every foe he had faced was defeated with a fluid and flexible ease, and one by one the beaten challengers sulked away, sadly dragging their swords on the ground and shaking their heads in confusion. 
To be fair, most were outmatched by the young man. He was long and lean and stronger than nearly anyone he had ever met in a bout. But that didn't stop one foolish man from thrusting not a sword at him, but a low-down insult instead. This man, named Picard, made a nasty remark about the color of Joseph's skin. It was France of the 1760s, and during the reign of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, it was unusual to find a man of African descent in most places, let alone in royal courts or widely followed fencing matches. Joseph Boulogne, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, was from a sugar plantation on the island of Guadalupe, where his mother, Nanon, had been enslaved after having been taken from Senegal. But the black skin he shared with her was not the only thing he would be known for in his new home of France. At first, Joseph blocked Picard's insult like one of the thousands of thrusts from a sword that he had parried before, and he proudly resolved to go about his life. It was not the first time he had been insulted because of the color of his skin, and he knew it would not be the last. This man throwing insults, though, was one of the best fencers in all of France and he challenged Joseph to a duel. Again, Joseph ignored the man. Eventually, he accepted. He was probably motivated by the promise from his father that he would receive a brand new horse and carriage if he beat the jerk. Now, before long, it was a common sight to see Joseph zipping around the streets of Paris with a beautiful horse and a brand new carriage as he had made short work of the little insulting man. But with the win over Picard came a boost in profile. He was now the most famous and best fencer in France, that was clear, and that brought attention from the rest of Europe. Perhaps the best fencer anywhere else was Italy's Giuseppe Gian Foldoni. Foldoni, as he was known, was a very well-known instructor, and he wanted to see just how good this Joseph really was. Now, there was no way that Joseph could say no to this challenge. An excited crowd of spectators gathered to watch the anticipated bout between the Italian teacher and the young black man. Despite the hoopla and fanfare, this match would not go quite the same way for Joseph. It was a classic case of experience defeating youthful physicality. But unlike his prior opponent, the elder Faldoni was not a jerk. After the hard-fought victory over Joseph, Faldoni's critical eye recognized Joseph's extraordinary talent. And the Italian said he was quite certain that Joseph would grow to be the best fencer in Europe someday. What he might not have realized was that fencing was just one of Joseph's many gifts. When he was a boy growing up in the Caribbean, Joseph saw the terrible conditions of the enslaved who toiled on the islands, processing sugar to benefit other people around the world. Yet he was also fortunate enough to be exposed to some of the beauty of this world. His beauty came in the form of music. Joseph's father owned one of these sugar plantations, where his mother Nanon had been enslaved to him. Eventually, the three of them would move to his father's native France, and continually, Mr. Boulogne would try to give Joseph as many opportunities as his money and connections would allow. The first of such instances would be violin lessons. Though his first teacher is reported to have been a wretched musician, Joseph nevertheless took to the instrument. The schools in Paris, though, offered the boy a much better chance to develop his natural abilities. Once there, he split his time learning history, philosophy, and logic with fencing and music. When he needed a break from the stress of school, he'd go horseback riding or swim across the Seine River. Young Joseph was known to show off from time to time. One of the ways he would do so is to swim the Seine River with one arm tied behind his back. His violin teachers wouldn't let him try the same trick in their studios, though. By the time Joseph lost the fencing match to Faldoni, he was already an incredibly accomplished musician. This is why it doesn't surprise most historians to see him pop back up just a few years later in the company of none other than Marie Antoinette. 
the Queen of France. Even while his fencing career was active, several composers wrote music especially for him to perform. This would indicate that he was an unusually good violinist. In 1769, Joseph was playing first violin in an orchestra called Le Concert de Amateurs. When the director of the orchestra stepped down, Joseph stepped up right into his place. It was a remarkable position for anyone. And we should note that this usage of the word amateur was in the French tradition of the word. It would not indicate that he was not as good as a professional, nor that he was performing for free. Quite the opposite. The word shares a root with amare, which means to love. Amateur, in this case, means lover of. And Joseph was most certainly a lover of music. As it would turn out, so was Marie Antoinette. When the illustrious Paris Opera lost their director, Marie and her husband Louis chose Joseph Boulogne Chevalier de Saint-Georges to lead the organization. It was an exciting time. Doors had opened for the polymath musician, and the prospect of leading one of the greatest musical groups in Europe would give him the opportunity to grow even more. But while he was making plans for an operatic future, some of the performers were appealing to the queen in the shadows backstage. They believed it was beneath them to take direction and musical orders from a black man. This was unfair. It was a terrible way to treat another human. It was also incredibly unreasonable because Joseph was a perfect fit for the job. Rather than force the queen into a fight, Joseph respectfully removed his name from consideration. He would not apply for the job after all, and the position could be filled with someone less controversial, which it was. No one is really sure how anyone felt in this conflict. Most people believe that Marie Antoinette felt terrible. She had nothing but admiration for Joseph, but she couldn't make everyone else think the way that she thought. But more importantly, we'd assume that Joseph would be filled with anger. If he was, he never wrote anything down about it at all. Sadly, this was not uncommon for his lifetime in France. But this was not the end of the relationship between Joseph and the Queen. She herself was quite an accomplished musician, having learned as a girl to sight read at the piano as well as nearly any professional. When they were both children, she had actually met the famed musical prodigy Mozart. She still enjoyed playing and was a patron of composers.